Well, uh, God was going on holidays, decided he needed a vacation, and the Trinity was discussing within themselves where they should go. And so the Holy Spirit uh, suggested they go to Melbourne for their vacation. But the Father said, oh, no thanks. Uh, They think I'm a woman in Melbourne. And the Father then suggested, well, how about Perth? We go to Perth for our holidays. And the Son said, are you kidding me? They think I'm still dead in Perth. And so the Son said, well, how about we go to Sydney for our vacation? To which the Spirit said, oh, yes, please. I've never been to Sydney. Now, if you, uh, if you don't quite understand that joke, it's because you may not have come across that all too common slur against Sydney Anglicans that we believe in the Father, the Son and the Holy Bible. Uh, now, while Sydney Anglicans probably don't give the Spirit the time or the credit he deserves, uh, the passage that was just read for us is about giving the Scriptures the time and the credit it deserves. Now, this does not mean elevating the Bible uh, to equal status with the Father and the Son. Okay, So the Bible is not God. We know this. But here's the thing. Apart from God giving us himself, that's Father, Son and Spirit, the Bible is the single greatest gift God has ever given to mankind. Right? So this, this gift here, it's not like you know, giving your wife a Stairmaster for Christmas or your husband like a body hair grooming kit for his birthday. All right? The Bible is the single greatest gift God has ever bestowed upon humanity outside of a relationship with the Father through the Son in the Spirit. And the reason for this is that the Bible is God revealing himself to humans and revealing how humans can best live in this world. All right? you just, you, when you think about it, you cannot actually put a price on this book here. But if that's not appealing enough, the Bible also reveals the future. Uh, as its title suggests, the book of Revelation is God revealing to his people what the future holds. Now let's just think about that for a second. Right? When Marty McFly travelled to the future in Back to the Future 2, uh, he buys for himself a sports almanac. It's a sports encyclopedia that has a list of every sporting result for the next 30 years. And what he wants to do is he wants to take it to the, you know, to the TAB and ho- in the hopes of enhancing his future. Right? Uh, but instead it gets into the wrong hands and ends up destroying his future. But the Bible, and in particular the book of Revelation, is our sports almanac. All right? It tells us how to enhance our life based on knowing how it all turns out. And the passage that was just read for us today uh, asks the question, how are we going to handle such a valuable gift? How are you and I, as Christians, uh, going to actually treat this priceless gift? And look, I've got three points today. You can see it on the inside of your news sheet. Three points to help us uh, uh, once again unpack the vivid imagery of Revelation so that we can understand its message. So like I said last week, um, the Apostle John understood the vision that was revealed to him in this book, as did his original readers. And so if you and I are able to unpack the strange imagery in this passage today, then we can understand its important message and undertake to do what it tells us. And we've got three points on how to handle God's word. Uh, They're quite straightforward. We're going to see firstly how we are to study it, verses 1 to 4. We are to savour it, verses 5 to 9. And we are to spread it, verses 9 to 11. And uh, each of those points, is we're going to be applying this passage as we go along with each of these points. But my hope is that by the end, we will have a better handle on how we as Christians are to treat the second greatest gift God has ever given mankind. So let's dive into God's word and see how we can study it. Uh, We are to savour it and we are to spread it. Now, Revelation chapter 10 is, is another interlude in this big long vision that John is being given here. So if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 comes between the sixth 
and seventh seals. It's kind of an interlude between the sixth and seventh seals. And it outlined how uh, God protects the 144,000. God protects his people from the coming judgments. Well, in the same way, Revelation 10 sits between the sixth and seventh trumpets. It's another interlude. And this interlude outlines what God's people are to do with this information, with this revelation. And it begins with these words. <clears throat> uh, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face shone like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. Now, these four descriptions here of this angel are attributed elsewhere to, uh, to, the, to, to Jesus in the Bible. And it leads many scholars to think, well, this, this angel here is Jesus. He's being described the same way Jesus is described. The problem is, nowhere else in the Bible is Jesus ever called an angel, even, even a mighty angel. Uh, so I think that this is probably uh, more likely one of the more impressive, more glorious angels in heaven. It's not Jesus, it's just a massively impressive and glorious angel. And uh, we read this in verse 2. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And planting one foot on the sea and one foot on the land uh, symbolizes authority over the whole earth, all right, over the land and the sea. So whatever this angel is about to do or say, he is given authority to do or say it for the whole earth, uh, for the land and the sea. And what does he do? Verse 3. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the, voice, uh, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Now, what's going on here? What are these seven thunders? Well, we believe this is a reference to God's own voice. Right, the seven thunders is God speaking. So in, in Psalm 29, if you want to write that down and you can look it up later on, in Psalm 29, we are told that the voice of the Lord thunders. And that very same psalm mentions the phrase, the voice of the Lord, seven times. All right? Uh, so this is, this is John picking up Old Testament in imagery once again, uh, this time to describe the voice of the Lord. So we hear the voice of the Lord saying something. We're, getting, we're saying, all right, this is God speaking. Uh, what's he going to say? But then a voice from heaven says a fascinating thing to John. He says, uh, do not reveal what the seven thunders have said. Right? Even though this book is called the book of Revelation, we have something here that John is told to not reveal. Now, why would God do this? Right? He's just spoken. Surely he wants us to know this. I mean, it's, it's kind of like someone coming up to us and saying, oh, look, I have some inside information on those stocks that you're looking to invest in. And we go, oh, what's that inside information? And they go, oh, I can't tell you. It's like, come on, man, why tell me that you've got this inside information if you can't tell me what it is? That's just mean. Is that what God is doing here? Uh, well, no, he has a different motive in mind. And that motive is to show us that you and I don't get to know everything. Right? God doesn't reveal everything to his people. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord. But the things revealed belong to us. You see, while God has revealed to us everything we need for life and faith, all right, there are some things we're just not privy to. And the reason God tells us in the book of Revelation is because the book of Revelation attracts uh, the most speculation about things God doesn't tell us. All right, so there's people uh, trying very hard to sort of calculate the exact... You know, they, they think about things like calculating the exact time that Jesus is going to return or they're trying to figure out exactly what the mark of the beast is. We're going to be looking at that in a couple of weeks' time. The thing is, we're not told what these things are in the Bible. That info belongs to the Lord. And so the first thing we learn about how to handle God's word in this passage is that we need to study it specifically to figure out what it is God has or hasn't revealed to us. 
And we need to make sure we don't go into very dangerous and unnecessary speculation about the kinds of things that God has chosen to not reveal to us, like too many people have uh, with this book. All right, so how do we treat God's word? Well, we are first to study it, in part to know what is secret and what is revealed. Right, so after we we see this, uh, you know, don't write this bit down. The angel raises his right hand to heaven, sort of kind of like what we do in a court of law. And he swears, uh, not on the Bible, but by the creator. And uh, he says two things. Firstly, the end is near. All right, there's no more delay. The end is near. Now, what does that mean? Uh, It presumably means we're in the last days. Okay, so these, these first six trumpets, they're happening right now. And then secondly, he says that the mystery of God, all right, the secret things that belong to the Lord, will be revealed on the last day, right, when the seventh trumpet blows. Uh, so we can uh, look forward to that. Just uh, stop speculating right now. Then after that, we move on to Act 2 in this chapter, in this passage. And that is that John is told to go and take the scroll. So we learn that the angel's holding the scroll. John is told, go and take the scroll in the angel's hand. Now, we can't be certain, but this scroll is probably, most probably, the scroll from chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, that had the seven seals on it. And those seven seals have now been removed and the scroll lays open in his hand. And then he's told, as we heard, heard earlier... To eat the scroll, verse 9. Now, remember, uh, this is a vision, all right? So John probably wasn't physically eating paper, okay? It is a symbolic gesture to imply taking God's word in. All right, it is to listen to God's word and to meditate on it and to savour it. All right, so we're told this in verse 9. Where is it? Uh, In your mouth... Uh, yeah, verse 9, sorry, down it. Take and eat it. It will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. It will be as sweet as honey. Now, what does this mean? Well, again, symbolism. It is symbolizing, it is apply, implying that God's word is pleasing. Right? Whenever we ingest God's word, read or meditate God's word, it is designed to be pleasing. Now, why is this? Well, it's because everything the Bible says is truthful and helpful. Reading the Bible is not meant to be this boring religious practice that we feel obliged to do. It is God revealing the truth in order to help us enhance our life. Uh, Do you understand the enormous benefits that brings? Like, do you understand the enormous benefits that Christians have over people who ignore God's word? Well, let me give you an example. There was a book released uh, a few months ago. I only heard about it this week. It's called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Now, it's actually uh, next on my list to read. It's written by British author Louise Perry, who is, get this, a uh, a left-wing, non-Christian, feminist journalist who used to write for The Guardian. On paper, she is about as far away from where I stand uh, as you can get. But she spent the last couple of years researching the effects of the sexual revolution. All right, so since the 1960s, uh, the West has been trying to sort of ditch the the stuffy hang-ups, is what they say, the stuffy hang-ups of sexual uh, traditionalism, and and, and the West has been seeking uh, to enjoy erotic freedom. All right? And Perry's findings are summarised by one reviewer as this. Uh, this. This reviewer says, The main winners from a world of rough sex hookup culture and ubiquitous porn where anything goes and only consent matters, right? The main winners are a tiny minority of high status men, not the women forced to accommodate the excesses of male lust. 
So in a nutshell, she's saying that the messages that have been rammed down the throats of women and girls since the 1960s, that they should be seeking to have carefree sex with as many partners as they care to, uh, have sex just like men do, that has wrought enormous psychological and emotional damage on women. Now the thing that saddens me about her thesis is it has taken some 60 years and four generations of seriously sexually damaged women and girls to figure out through experimentation exactly what the Bible's been telling us all along. And the Bible has told us that porn and hookup culture and serial monogamy are seriously damaging to women. But that monogamous marriage protects women and children. And here's the thing, those of us who have listened to the sweet words of the Bible, as opposed to what society has been ramming down our throats for the last 60 years, uh, we have saved ourselves a lifetime of shame and regret. That's what the angel means when he says God's word is sweet. Right? It tells us what our wonderful creator is like to begin with, but also how to avoid the pain and suffering that comes from ignoring his word for us. And my question is this. Do we believe this? Do we believe the Bible is the most sweet, pleasing and life-enhancing thing on the planet? But by believe, I don't mean head knowledge. You see, most of us, we hear week in, week out. Uh, we know cognitively. Uh, we hear week in, week out how good the Bible is. All right, We come here every week to sit under it. We know it up here. My question is, are we living that knowledge out? All right, are we savouring the Bible as the most enjoyable thing we do each and every day? Now, if not... And how do we make this the case? How do we ensure that we are savouring this priceless gift the way it should be savoured? Well, friends, there is only one way, as far as I can tell, to do this. Now, you know, I sometimes say, look, if you only take one thing away from this sermon, this is what I want you to take away. You've heard me say that before, all right? Uh, look, as of last Thursday... I have been at this church 11 years. So last Thursday was my 11th year anniversary. All right. Now, whether I'm here for another year or another 10 years, if there is one thing I want you to take away from my entire time at Earlwood Anglican, this is what I want you to take away. The only way, as far as I can tell, to delight in God as our ultimate treasure is, number one, be proactive in setting aside time every day to read God's word and pray. And number two, pray and ask God to make you savour it. Now here's the thing. We should not expect God to answer that prayer, that second part of what I'm telling you to do, unless we have first engaged in the first part. Right? It's, like, uh, it's like praying for God to give you a new job. Okay, maybe he'll dump an, uh, the perfect job in your lap without you having to do anything, uh, having, having to lift a finger. But 99% of the time, God answers the prayer for a new job through us applying for new jobs. Right? We should not expect to find a new job by just lying on the couch and watching TV. And in the same way, unless we get off the couch and actually set aside time to enjoy God through his sweet word, God is not going to answer our prayer. So friends, if you only take one thing away from my time as rector of Earlwood Anglican, now if you're not a Christian, please take away Jesus is Lord, all right? But most of us here are Christians. If you take only one thing away from my entire time here, this is what I want, all right? Set aside 15, 20, 30 minutes every day this week, right? Turn the TV off. Shut your social media down. Set aside 20 to 30 minutes every day this week just to spend time with God. And when you start every day, 
Pray and ask that God will make you enjoy it so much that you will not be able to wait to come back and do it again tomorrow. All right, that's what we're to do with God's word. We are to study God's word and we are to savour God's word. Then finally, we are to spread it. Well, John is told that the scroll will be sweet in his mouth. He's also told it will turn sour in his stomach. Verse 10, I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, it turned my, uh, it, my stomach turned sour. Now, why does John's stomach turn sour? It's because while God's word is true and helpful, part of that truth is the judgment that awaits those who ignore God's word. All right, so the prophet Ezekiel was also told to eat a scroll. Again, it's all Old Testament imagery in this book here. He was told to eat a scroll as part of his commissioning as a prophet. And uh, we were told at the end of Ezekiel chapter 2, if you want to look it up later on, we're told that that scroll is full of words of lament and warning and woe. All right, in the same way, this scroll tells of the end time judgments that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. And the reason God, uh, John is told to take in God's word is because he is then to tell it out. Verse 11. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. Now, friends, yes, this command here in verse 11 is given specifically to John. But let me read to you the third verse of the book of Revelation. This is Revelation 1 verse 3. It says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Right? John was not told to write this prophecy down so that the churches can either ignore it or keep it to ourselves. Right? The Great Commission is still active today in 2022. And spreading this sour part of this prophecy is part of that great commission now here's the thing we need to keep in mind with this okay god knows it's sour god knows people aren't going to like it god knows people may ignore us or ridicule us or reject us or even worse oppose us and persecute us if we speak these sour words of judgment to them. Yet he calls us to spread this word to the lost. And there are two very good reasons why he calls Christians to spread this word of judgment to those currently in rebellion against God. All right, so the first is, it's actually not helpful to keep the truth from people. Rather, it's hateful. Picture it this way. Imagine uh, you're running down a hill. You can close your eyes, all right? You're running down a hill in a forest, uh, and and at the bottom of the the hill is a massive, deep ravine. The reason you're running down the hill is because you're you're trying to escape a raging bushfire. And as you're running down the hill, you notice there's a whole bunch of other people running down the hill as well. And these people are heading a little bit upstream to try and get away from the bushfire. But you know... There is no escape upstream. You know there is only one bridge to cross that ravine and it is downstream. And so you've got a choice now. You can either not bother those people with this vital information for fear that they might ridicule you or oppose you for telling them about this bridge. Or you can share that information with them and let them make the decision as to whether they follow your advice or not. Now, friends, you and I have been given the words of eternal life. Yes, our non-Christian friends and family may ignore us. They may ridicule us. They may even oppose us. But please know it is not helpful to keep the truth from them. That's hateful. So that's the first reason God wants us to spread the sourness of God's word. The second reason is it glorifies Jesus more. Uh, You see, if we don't tell people about the judgment that is to come, then nor can we tell them 
about how Jesus took that judgment on behalf of his people. And this actually cheapens the gospel. So let me explain. Uh, Two weeks ago, George told a story in this pulpit about how his laptop died. You remember that? And he mentioned how I gave him a replacement laptop that 